Welcome back to State and Local. I'm Anne Marie Battistone. Now, the countdown to November 4th has definitely started. And I have another candidate here with me today who really needs no introduction because she's been with me twice before. And she is an upstanding citizen of Norfolk. It's Norfolk's own Patricia St. Auburn, who is running for state auditor. So we're very pleased to have her here. And we're so proud that we've got, you know, somebody, another candidate that's from, from Norfolk. So, oh, thank oh, you so much, Patricia. I, I am Marie. Thank, thank you. you again for having me here. Oh, you're, well, you're more, oh, more than you welcome. You know, this is an easy jaunt. <laughs> now, what I want to talk about is this fabulous news about the Globe endorsement. Yes, um, that came out online on Friday night, and uh, it was in the paper on Saturday. Uh, my 90-year-old mo mother liked the fact that I trumped Galvin, that I was at the top, oh, yes. top of the fold. <laughs> on the editorial oh, page right. that day um, for the endorsement. So I was very pleased. Uh, they uh, allowed me in for their editorial board. I made a presentation. I made my case. Oh, that's how it works? Yes. And um, they um, listened to what I had to say and obviously felt that I was the better candidate for the job, given my background um, with that Providence College degree in accounting and the fact that I have audited professionally in the private sector, yes, but auditing is auditing. Well, of course, you know, I mean, their, their readers are mostly Democrats. I noticed they kind of tried to gloss over the things that she'd done, didn't really refer to them. You know, I said, this is not so damning in and of itself, but, you know, so they, they came to that, you know, conclusion. Well, I, I found it rather glowing for myself and for my candidacy. And to be fair, it is hard to run, step up, and do um, the job of being a candidate. So they always try to throw some compliments yeah, to oh, yeah, whoever's oh, no, right. the other candidate. And the final, in the final analysis, you know, they endorsed you. Right, exactly. You know. As I say, glowingly, too. And, you know, so now, um, you know, if we, if we, you know, we, we can put that link on the bottom of the screen if people want to, if they miss that. If they want to read it. Oh, sure. So we'll give that to Katie and she uh, can put that on the bottom absolutely. and they can. It was in Saturday's, uh, this past Saturday's. Uh, yeah, I read paper, the, yeah, I read it. But on it the, is online. I read it online. Um, now, what about her, the audits that, that have been done now? And, and I, I understand that she went back in terms of the number of audits and how quickly they need to be done over the time frame. That at some point she went back, now she was a former state rep. Right. And so she went back to the legislature to get an extension of right. time. And so that would mean how many should she be doing a year? Well, um, if we can follow the timeline, because I have done the research, I also have a master's in American history, so primary source, documents, <laughs> the primary source documents are very important. So Suzanne came into office um, in January of 2011, and she had a uh, review done of that office, which determined at that time that there was a mass general law. Now, she probably knew about this when she was running. Uh, she certainly knew about it when she accepted the office in January. But in March, she was told of 2011 that there was a mass general law, section uh, 11, chapter 12, that said, excuse me, chapter 11, section 12 of the mass general laws that said that there were 375 state agencies um, that do receive taxpayers' dollars, that, that's procurement money and, um, you know, appropriated funds and whatnot. So anyway, she was told that those agencies and what had happened under Joe, Joe DiNucci, that they should be audited once every two years. And that equated to 187.5 audits on an annual basis. Now, she then wrote back to this organization and said that she didn't feel with her staffing that she had an ability to do that. I happened to watch her interview last night that you did with her, and she said the le legislature had informed her of that. Well, that's not what is in the primary source documents. What's in the primary source documents is that she initiated discussions with the legislature right. to change that right, law. Right. And she did so by April 15th of 2011 when she wrote back. She had already started those discussions. By the summer of 2011, with the budgetary process of 2012, Mm -hmm. that law was in the works of being revised. And it got revised to that those 375 state agencies now are audited once every three years. Mm -hmm. And that equates to 125 audits on an annual basis. But I have been on New England Cable News and elsewhere with my handy chart. This, uh, this is the results, Anne-Marie. Um, here's 125. She met the threshold the first year with 133 audits. But Danucci got her across the line. Right, because if you right, review right, them right. the way I have, the opening statements in those first uh, few audits indicate that they were started under her predecessor right. and she finished them up. Her second year in office, she did 89 audits. 
Her third year in office, which was last year, 2013, she did 64 audits. And as of September 1st of this year, she's only produced 32 audits. Now, I will give her credit for four more audits through the month of September. So as of October 1st, her office has only produced 36 audits. So there is a precipitous decline hmm. here. When she even changed the law astonishing. to 125 audits, that's her new threshold. Right, right. Her threshold when she took office was 187.5 audits, and she's not met the, met the goal but once. And I'm fearful, and the taxpayers should be as well, that if we keep her in office another four years, where do these audits diminish to? Wow. And she somehow That's by feels, half. It dropped by half, 64 to 32. <laughs> Yes. I mean, she has three more months to go, October, November, well, how December. how much can you do it? Yes. And we got the holidays and, you right. know, everything else. So she may get 50 or just a little bit beyond 50 for 2014. But this is, this is the reality. This is from her website. Do you she feel... She does not argue these figures. Do you... Right. I, I know. Yeah. Do you feel that she, uh, when she went to the legislature, that she used her con contacts from being a state rep... Well, it, it's I mean, possible. It's I mean, she has been up there since um, the early 1980s. Um, she was someone's uh, assistant, you know, deputy director or whatever. She was a, a liaison up there. And then she became a state rep in 1985. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so she knows those people. And then, yes. So she's been up there in, in a couple of different ways. Um, and she is very familiar. And the state legislator later is, you know, um, it's, well, it's not stacked in our favor. Oh, no. Oh, God, So no. it is, <laughs> you know, those are her <laughs> friends. Like, that's so, I mean, she's also got... I, people also know, I mean, when she spoke to you, she said that her office should be very independent. And that is true. It should be independent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can't vote and legislate. But she does go back to the state legislature frequently. She also has legislation pending right now with tax credits that some companies receive. And she wants to go in and she wants to financially audit those companies to make sure that those tax credits are, you know, legitimately being used by companies. But here's the thing, Anne Marie, yeah. her legislation actually deems it okay to go in and take a hold of someone's 1040, their own individual uh, return to the government. It doesn't just hold to what she might want to look at at the company. She oh. can personally go and look at the president of a company that's getting these tax credits and look at their tax return, their huh. personal tax return. That's the kind of legislation that she thinks is okay in her job, wow. but she can't perform her job. Huh. My goodness. So, you know, these are the types of arguments that I was able to get across to the globe. And they heard me, and obviously it resonated. Well, now it's going to resonate with the voters right. on November 4th. Now, let me, let's talk about something else here. I'm interested in this fellow in Chelsea Housing Authority, McLaughlin. Now, right. he was coming down. He had a $350,000 salary. Right. And he, went, he, did, he was convicted. Right. Now, and, the whoops. importance of that yeah. is that that happened not during her time frame. Okay. But people have to keep in mind that the audit did come out on the Chelsea Housing Authority in January of 2011. Mm -hmm. And it's about three pages long, and she signed off all was okay. That's one part of it that's bothersome to me. But Anne-Marie, what's more important here is that when you audit, you take a picture of time of an organization. And that picture of time tells you things. And it relates to the next picture of time. And it also might send up red flags. And clearly what happened with McLaughlin was a red flag. So consequently, when you see that happening in one organization, and it's not to say that every executive director at these housing authorities is doing the same thing. No, sure. But that's why you go back and you look to see if possibly, if it's been done once, then it had, can be done twice. It may not be done 40 times. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that in the audits of the housing authorities. Going back to see what these other salaries were. Exactly. And... What the executive director's contracts are and what their salaries are. And that's what an audit does. And if she truly wants to be saving money for the taxpayer, which is what her organization is all about, then she should be looking similarly at all housing authorities. And particularly when there's an egregious act that's occurred, then all the other housing authorities should be looked at similarly. And I don't see that. When I look at the housing authority audits, in fact, McLaughlin did the Worcester Housing Authority are audit. They, are they readily available? Yes, they're all online. Um, McLaughlin actually did do the Worcester Housing Authority audit in 2009. 
Now, that agency has not been audited since. It was done in January. You mean Suzanne Bump did the audit? No. McLaughlin? No. Oh, I'm, I'm No. This is the Worcester Housing Authority. I went back to review this. This was done under Danucci. Oh, okay. And in, it was done in 2009. It has not been audited since. Come January oh. of 2015, it'll be six, six years, years since that has been audited. Now, nonetheless, when you take a look at the audit, um, and you can see here my yeah. numbers, there are 13 line items that were reviewed, and then the 14th item talks about the prior audit and whether or not the things that were addressed and commented on in the private uh, prior audit have been improved upon. And that's not a bad audit. I take a look at the Franklin Housing Authority audit that was done under Suzanne Bump's watch. and Completely. Completely, completely under yeah. hers, yes, in 2013. And it's three pages in length, and it does not have oh. 13 oh. items that it reviewed. It reviewed one item, Chapter oh. 30B, Procurement Issues. Oh, these and, are, oh, I see, okay. So I'm trying to, this is what auditing should look like. Danucci now, didn't do a bad job. Oh, Danucci did this. Okay. Danucci did this. So this is the Worcester Housing Authority. Number one, I have a problem with nobody having been back to the Worcester Housing Authority but since that's 2009. But that's But that goes her. back yeah, to, to her. our list yes. of declining audits. Um, but nonetheless, when she has done a housing authority, and she said right here in your interview that all the housing authorities are uh, audited similarly. She said that because I watched it last night. And... That is not the case. That is not what I am finding. Hmm. I'm finding that well, all these housing <laughs> authorities are reviewing one or two items, and then not. They might review an inventory control list. They look might look at a means test, whether or not someone that has an apartment or a unit in the hmm. housing authority it is, uh, you know, not qualified. Out, right. Right. With oh, a job. Plenty of that. Plenty of that going on. <laughs> And it's a toonie. So, or the procurement issues, or looking at the executive director's contract. Um, none of these housing authorities, from what I can see, are audited similarly. And that should be auditing. That is, you know, auditing when you go in and you do have your working pages, and you go in and you find a baseline at every organization, and you audit similarly. This is where the professionalism that I can bring to this office is important. So, because I didn't want you to talk about something that she said that there were different sorts of auditing, and there was, you know, I think in the in the in the interview with her, it came out. It was talking about financial audit versus performance. Yes. Well, she so also said, you, um, if you, you know, and she says rebut, this yeah. frequently that when you audit, you know, for the state auditor's office, that you follow the money. Isn't that financial? Right. Right. Exactly. Um, that you want to know what they spent their money on. She said, Expensive. and then um, what did you get for it? I've heard her say that many times. Those are her three taglines about this audit. Her own website talks about um, the auditor's office is committed to ensuing that every dollar given to the state government is a dollar well spent. Now, who's best to do that? Someone that has audited in the private sector and has done financial audits. Because even when you look at these performance audits, they have financial components to them. And if you're looking for how these money is well spent, it has to have a financial component to it. But let's back up a minute about my degree in accounting. And I have that bachelor's in accounting from Providence College. And when you go and you study accounting, you're not in a vocational school where half the class says, I think I'm going to go work for government and do governmental auditing. And the other half uh -huh. of the class says, I'm going to go into a private sector. Right, right. Auditing is auditing. We all go through the same four years of studying accounting, and nobody really knows where they're going to accept a job. So when you do auditing in the private sector, yes, certainly the stockholders or the shareholders or the price of the stock or the president of the company, whether or not they want to be solvent or not, an audit will indicate that. But in the governmental sector, it's the public's interest that you're auditing for. Instead of the shareholder's mm -hmm. interest, it right. reverts to the public exactly. interest which you and I, as the taxpayers, are. So there really isn't that much dissimilarity with auditing. Because when I asked her about it, she, was, she said that the com there's a comptroller that they hire. What, That's what, correct. Explain that to me. She is correct. Yeah. But let me, let me here? back up on that as well. A comptroller was, um, came in to review the state in its entirety, and that was done in the 40s and 50s. 
So this is nothing recent. This did not occur under her watch. This is because the state became too large for the auditor's office to have under its full domain everything that goes on in the treasurer's office, in the uh, attorney general's office, what goes on you know, with the governor's office and all the other agencies that don't fall under the purview of the auditor's office. There are only 375 agencies that now fall under the auditor's purview. So yes, she is correct, a comptroller, and they do have a contract right now with KPMG, I think she said, yeah. KPMG, exactly. And so, but this is nothing new. When the state became very large and beyond the auditor's scope to be able to be reviewed properly, they did go out to an outside source. But this literally has gone on since the 40s or 50s. So let's just, you know, peel back the onion on that one. Right. Hmm. Now, um, there was something else that I wanted to ask you about. It had to do with the... Um the national, the NSAA, it's the uh, national, national States uh, Auditors, Auditors Association. Association. Yes, and uh, a rating that they gave to her. Now, d didn't they find fault with Danucci at one point? Yes, before um, she came in. Yeah. Well, here's what happened. Um, Suzanne again was elected in January of 2011. Um, she didn't have a degree in accounting like I do. Auditing, you know, was probably a little bit unfamiliar to her. So she went out to this National States Auditors Association, which is down in Kentucky, and she paid $3,500 for them to come in, our money, to do a peer review to tell her what was going on in that office. And they did find that there were some people that didn't have, um, you know, beyond a high school education or an associate's degree that were doing the auditing Oh, work. my Lord. So she did <laughs> elevate and professionalize her staff based upon what she was told. She also got the boilerplate and template on how to set up an auditing office, which I studied for four years and learned in the private sector for about three and a half years. Um, nonetheless, um, you know, and to keep that in mind, she professionalized the organization. Mm -hmm. She elevated everybody to at least a bachelor's degree, many people having a bachelor's in accounting, and we still have a decline in mm -hmm. audits. So nonetheless, um, they did they had never been reviewed before because I've called them down in Kentucky. I spent 40 minutes on the phone asking questions and um, I found out that they had never been reviewed. So that's why they were failed because they needed to start a benchmark. So then they do actually audit Anne Marie, this organization, once every three years. So they came back and they audited again this year. And she got what she likes to say is the highest grade. Well, the highest grade is a pass. <laughs> okay, so that is the highest grade. And when I spoke to them down in Kentucky, well, it's I said... misleading, isn't it? I would say. I, when you get an A, B, C, or D, right. you can say an A is exactly. the highest grade. So it's like a um, pass-fail. Yes. And uh, 48 states contract with the National States Auditors Association, and I asked how many get the pass. And they Most all do. Most of them. Oh, all. Yes. Now, some of them oh. get passed with a couple of you so know, little mean demerits, a great deal. little demerits that they need to keep mm -hmm, working mm -hmm. at. But what the executive director told me, the whole reason why the states pay these $3,500 every three years to get this designation is that their whole intention is to get every state to pass. They don't want states failing. That the first time they reviewed, they had established themselves as an organization in 1989, and Danucci never took advantage of this. So they had to sort of get a benchmark of what was going on in there, and he did have some bad practices, and so that's did why they fail under the, did it fail under Danucci? Well, it was she that did it, but mm -hmm. it was really Danucci's work uh, okay. because right, she had right, just right. come yes, in in true. January yes. okay, right. when she first contracted right. with them. But yes, um, just again to peel back the onion. Um, this designation that Suzanne likes to say is the highest grade, it is the highest grade, but it's a pass, and 48 out of 48 states that contract it's get like the pass. It doesn't mean very much then, does it? Well, <laughs> you said it. I mean, <laughs> um, but this is, this is, you know, what people need to understand when they're going out to vote, that I have really been auditing the auditor's office for the last 10 months. Now, regards to that, you had some, uh, you, you spoke about um, some traveling that she did that you thought some of it was questionable as far as whether it was her duty as the auditor to go or she was going for political reasons well, as an individual. I, yes, Is that, a, am I? Yeah. There's a gentleman that works for Commonwealth Magazine 
His oh, name's yes, I read that Coleman article. Herman, and he wrote the article. He actually went and pulled all of her um, records on what expenditures she's had, and he did the work, and he happened to call me up. That was fortuitous for you, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, wow. it was, and um, I met with him. I wasn't, you know, because it was his story, he didn't show me everything, mm -hmm. but he did show me some items that mm -hmm. she had expense for, and one of the ones was um, going to the St. Patrick's Day breakfast, and she charged the state two miles, which seems rather petty, um, you know, I first should say off, so. to charge for two miles, which <laughs> was 90 cents. But nonetheless, um, everybody, at least people I know, would say that these St. Patrick's Day breakfast is a very political event. Right. That is not official duty yeah, oh, no. as auditor. Right. You're not out no, auditing exactly. an agency. Right. You're not really performing the role of an auditor. No. And that the attorney general, the treasurer, and I believe the governor were also there, and they did not put in for mileage to go to that, that event. She was the only one of the constitutional officers that put in for mileage for that particular event. So over the course of a year and a half, what Coleman Herman found with her um, expenditures is there's about $5,000 worth of expenditures where she is going and meeting with the unions and she's out at the Chamber of Commerce um, giving speeches there. And there's that fine line, are we really doing well, auditing work or is this a political It's not even really endeavor? that fine, is it? Because uh, in other words, the SEIU business, uh, you know, because they have a very bad reputation, SEIU. I mean, they go, they go to these Tea Party things, they, they fight with people, they bite people's fingers, they intimidate people. And I assume that they would, these unions would want these endorsements, uh, excuse me, would, would, excuse, pardon me, that these unions would be giving money so that perhaps when the time comes to audit where their people are working, it would be done a little, well, that, a little that's bit another, of a lighter. That's another um, big problem that people need to know about um, Suzanne, that she is in a civil lawsuit right now with her former top deputy and campaign manager, her campaign manager that thinly got her across the line the last time um, for this um, particular race, that um, this woman you know, has made some charges, there are allegations. I was not there, I've read the court document, um, but some of the allegations are the usage of the state house to disseminate uh, paid right. nomination yes. papers. But as a professional, what bothers me more is the other aspect of that particular lawsuit. And it was regarding the Department of Child and Family audit, oh. and there are SEIU oh, yeah, oh, employees Absolutely. there. And that um, Suzanne, found out after the fact that when Laura Marlin, her, is her name, and she was the top mm -hmm. deputy overseeing all oh, yeah. the audits, had not gone and allowed the unions to weigh in on that audit. And apparently there was a dust up. These are the allegations um, that are in the lawsuit that um, Laura went in with uh, what's called the Yellow Book, the Comptroller General's standard governmental auditing procedures and standards, and showed her where in the Yellow Book that talking to the unions compromises an audit. And I completely concur. And it certainly shouldn't have been right there in the office. Um, well, I mean, into the bargain, right? Well, that's a different story. Okay. That's where she was trying to set up a meeting. Mm -hmm. I'm talking professionally about what goes on during an audit. Mm -hmm. And nobody weighs in on an audit. The books, the oh, right. uh, invoices, and the paperwork tell the story. If you're looking at contracts or you're looking at laws and how they apply to these agencies. but anybody from a union, anybody when you're doing a private sector audit, the comptroller, the president of the company, nobody gets to weigh in. It's just the data right, that tells exactly. the story. So Suzanne, um, uh, and I've heard, she's argued this point with my debate on New England Cable News, that she does feel that the unions, because they have employees, should be able to weigh in on the audit. But I've found it in chapter three, of the Comptroller General's laws, and it's why should they? I, I mean, it makes no it, sense. It, I mean, it does. It, it compromises an audit. It's undue influence, and it's a bias threat. I mean, should the employees' families come in and talk to her as well? If the no, <laughs> you know, I think I mean, she wanted the management just, to weigh no, in. No, I understand. But it was just as ridiculous because well, it doesn't seem like it's really. And, and if you look at what she even I mean, said to you about why she feels that some of these organizations, because they want to do something better or they want to, you know, upgrade and they, you know, so, you know, the bottom line here is throw more money at that mm -hmm. agency. Mm -hmm. Rather than solve the problem mm -hmm. with an existing budget, 
you know, as a Republican. And meanwhile, I hear that as code as let's spend more money, let's get people weighing in so that we go back to the state legislature and ask for, for, for more money for that particular agency. Now, what's next on the campaign for you, Patricia? What, where are well, you going? Uh, tonight you and, uh, you know, this will probably air after the fact, but we have one more yeah. forum or debate, uh, Suzanne and I. I've had three with her already, and New England Cable News being one of them. And then I met her in Concord, and I also met her in Worcester. But tonight I'm going to be on the Dan Ray Show. It's at Fisher College in Boston, and a lot of the oh, candidates yes. will be there. It's oh, about, right. about 10 or 15 minutes. So. Um, it will be live on the Dan Ray show, so we have that coming up. Where, where, in, where do you know where specifically at Fisher College? If, if anybody wants to go, and um, well, is it open probably, to the public? Or? Yeah, it's tonight, so this probably won't be oh, aired that's true. in time. That's true. But it's on Beacon Street. Oh, okay, I, it's uh, one ten Beacon. I oh, think. Okay, um, but nonetheless, um, we have that, and we're just really busy this last week. You know, if anybody wants to help us, you know, feel free to get in touch Signs. with us. Um, yeah. Well, I didn't buy a lot of signs for the whole state. It's very costly to mm. do signs for the whole state. Oh, yes. So I have a few for Norfolk um, that we can t still disseminate. Uh, but, you know, the campaign's telephone number is 617-470-0115 and ask for Leah mm -hmm. if anybody wants to make a last-minute donation or come help us with phoning up at, you know, one of the Mass Victory uh, offices. That's right. Well, again, they wouldn't know, but tomorrow is a, a, a big phone day, isn't it? Yes, exactly. But any time from now and even election day to get out the vote, mm -hmm. it's very important. I know there's people, one in Dedham, there's there one in Taunton, Taunton Milford, and, and Milford. Framingham. Oh, okay. Yep. So if anybody wants to come and get out the vote for any of the Republican candidates, um, we're all working very hard to get the vote out. I've engaged with thousands of people. I've been to over 290 campaign stops since oh mid-February. My goodness! And I have a tab on my website, you know, campaign stops that shows how far, how far and wide across the state I've been. Well, you know, we'll have to close with that because we've just we've run out of time. Oh wow! Great. Oh, so thank you for coming, Patricia. <laughs> thank you for having and me good again, luck, Anne Marie. My goodness, thank and you. It won't be long now. It won't be long. <laughs> and thank, thank you for watching State and Local. I'm Anne Marie Battistone, and this is Norfolk Public Access. My guest was Patricia St. Aug who is running for state auditor. So please be sure to vote on November 4th. And lives in town.